For thousands of years, indigenous tribes controlled the North American continent. For centuries, the Spanish and then the French and then the British and then the Americans slowly made their way into indigenous land. After the American Civil War, the railroad brought a larger population of Americans deeper and deeper into the West. As more Americans settled, indigenous tribes were slowly moved to reservations while losing their way of life and culture. The late 1800s brought the United States power. However, it was a tragedy for the Native Americans. Welcome to Lessons in Humanities. For PowerPoints, Google Slides, primary source activities, and other teaching and learning materials, visit the Lesson in Humanities store. The link to the store is in the description below. Let's start with the reasons Americans settled West. Now, the first reason, gold, the rush for gold. Many reasons the settlers moved to the West, but gold was a very big reason. Gold has been a sought-out commodity for thousands of years. One reason for the Spanish to travel to the New World in the late 1400s was to find gold. People still value gold today. Mostly single men and some women ventured west in hoping to find gold and get rich. More money was made by businesses that helped the gold rust than the actual gold. For example, tools and clothing and services. Towns would form along these gold rushes where gold was found. And the women that went, they would often work in shops or saloons or boarding houses and brothels. Now, there are four and more gold rushes, but I'll mention four. The big one, obviously, is in 1848 to 1849, the California gold rush. 1858 is the Colorado gold rush. 1860 is the Clearwater gold rush in Idaho. And then 1874 to 78 is the Black Hills gold rush in South Dakota. Let's give you an example. Let's talk about Colorado and how it influenced Colorado. In the late 1800s, more and more territories in the West, which belonged to the United States government, would become states. And Colorado is one example. But for a long time, there were very few Europeans in that area. The first Europeans to go to Colorado uh, were the Spanish before, right? But not too many. But during the California gold rush, settlers moved through Colorado to get to California. They signed a treaty with the local tribes. In 1858, gold was also discovered in Colorado. So 100,000 settlers would go to Colorado to look for gold. They would create small towns, and there would also be conflicts with Native Americans in the area. 16 years later, there would be enough people to turn Colorado territory into a state. So the important point here is the discovery of gold brought more settlers into the West, and territories, which belonged to the American government at that time, would become states. Another reason many settlers went to the West was to hunt bison. So they could use the skin from the bison to make leather, which supplied belts in the eastern factories. They could also use raw materials for clothing. The skulls could be used for fertilizer. And many just wanted to kill bison for sport. For example, some people, some settlers that were on trains, would point the rifle outside the window and just shoot the bison for fun. And of course, hunting as a sport as well. In 1870, this was the peak year of the bison being slaughtered. So in the late 1800s, bison went from 10 million to only 300, extremely endangered. Now today, there are 500,000 bison in the United States. Ranches would eventually re replace bison with cattle, but this would completely change the way of life of the indigenous tribes who were dependent on the bison. Now, just a quick note. Some people will call bison buffalo, but actually that's a misnomer. A bison is, is the animal in the United States, but when the, the Spanish came, they mis mistook it for bison that had been recorded in Asia and also in Africa. Now, another reason people went to the West uh, is for a religion. So, for example, the Mormons went there. Now, the, Mor the Mormon faith, it, it began in the United States during the Second Great Awakening. It began in New York. In 
In between 1846 and 1848, Mormons went west to flee religious persecution. People didn't really trust the Mormons at that time because some, not all, were polygamists. They had many wives. And eventually their founder, Joseph Smith, was murdered. Now the Mormons would end up in Utah, and some would call it the New Jerusalem in the United States. 60,000 of them journeyed to Utah. Uh, and Utah would eventually become the supply point for people moving to the West. And their new leader after Joseph Smith was Brigham Young. And he encouraged the, the settlers to practice agriculture. Land was the number one reason settlers moved West. One reason Napoleon sold Louisiana in 1803, which was many years before this time period we're talking about, was because he thought the land was worthless. But with the railroads bringing people deeper and deeper into the West and improved technologies, the land became quite valuable. In fact, the West became the agricultural center of the United States. In 1862, Lincoln, during the Civil War, passed the Homestead Act. This gave male citizens 160 acres of land, and they could work the land and build a home and a barn and dig wells, and after five years, they could apply for the official deed. And hundreds of thousands of people acquired land through the Homestead Act. Now, when they moved west, many settlers, they followed traditional divisions of labor with the men working outside and the woman, women working inside the home. But along with all the other reasons moving to the west, this is going to transform the west with hundreds of thousands of farms become, be, being developed in the late 1800s. This section will talk about the conflicts between the Native Americans and the United States federal government. Wars between Native American tribes and Americans were actually quite sporadic. They were brief, and they were also with different tribes. Wars would hurt the Native Americans, uh, but not as bad as the economic and cultural destruction brought on by the influx of settlers. Native American removal was a federal policy before and after the Civil War. The Dakota War of 1862. More and more settlers arrived in the, the Dakota Territory and in the Minnesota area, which is a state. In 1850, there were 6,000 settlers in Minnesota. In 1858, there were 150,000 settlers in Minnesota. So that shows you how many people were moving there. The Dakota Nation was harmed by the arrival of so many settlers. The settlers would cut down forests, and this made it hard for the Native Americans to farm and also to hunt. So some were literally starving. There was a government official in the local area. His name was Andrew Merrick, and he was a trader and, like I said, a government official. And he reportedly said, if they are hungry, let them eat grass or, or, or eat their dung. So treaties would be signed between the U.S. and the Dakota Nation, but they would often be broken. And on August 17, 1862, Dakota fought back, and they killed five settlers. The Dakota knew the U.S. would retaliate, so they declared war. Dakota attacked a town near the U.S. government agency, and they killed 31 men, women, and children. And you remember that Andrew Merrick, who I said suggested they eat grass? Well, he was also killed, and he was found with grass stuffed in his mouth. Now, the Minnesota governor would call in the local militia and 303 Native Americans were convicted and sentenced to death. President Lincoln, who was the president at that time, he would commute all but 38. And this would be the largest mass execution in American history. Native Americans in the area, they would flee to Oklahoma, and then some would flee to Canada. And some of the Dakota reservations that were there were closed. Now the Sand Creek Massacre so this happened in 1850, sorry, this happened in 1864, but earlier in 1851 was the Treaty of Laramie. And this was between the U.S. and different tribes in the Colorado area. So I was talking about Colorado earlier. This is part of that. This gave Americans the right to pass through Colorado to get to California. Now in 1858, Colorado gold rust happened and the 100,000 settlers came, like I mentioned before. The settlers heard stories about the Cheyenne and the Arapahoes and the Comanches in the area. They also read stories about the Dakota War. Hence, the settlers in Colorado didn't really trust the Native Americans. So the settlers 
militia urged for a war, but the Cheyenne chief Black Kettle wanted to make peace. But the local militia moved in on a Cheyenne camp and slaughtered 200 men, women, and children. So the United States would pass an Indian, or create an Indian Peace Commission in 1867. So the United States at this time wanted to avoid future conflicts with the Native American tribes. So they created this board of Indian commissioners. And in part of this, this, uh, this group would be missionaries, and they would manage the Native American reservations. And they wanted to assimilate and re-educate and Christianize the Native Americans. They wanted Native Americans to adopt American gender roles. For example, men working in the field and women working in the home. But this was not the way of life that Native Americans were used to. So this was very difficult for them. And a lot of Native Americans at that time would be going to boarding schools. Uh, some of the boarding schools would be in the east and some would be in the west or the southwest. So for example, if you look at this picture... Uh, this boy, his name is Tom Tarlino, so obviously his name, he was given an English name, he was of the Navajo Nation. He went to this Indian school in Pennsylvania, and uh, he was founded by the U.S. government, and it prepared Native Americans to live under the United States system. Uh, so Native Americans from all over the country would be sent to this school and other schools, which would be used as an example uh, for other schools to be built. The first picture is Tarlino when he arrived at school in 1882. The second picture is when he left in 1886. Now there's going to be some more wars. Uh, we have the Red River War in 1871. So the Comanche and the Comanche were some of the strongest horse-riding Native Americans in, uh, on the plains, in the, the southern plains as well. Uh, Part of their economic activity was raiding small towns and villages. So before, many people were afraid of the Comanches, and that includes the Mexicans and the people in Texas. So they signed a treaty with the U.S. government, the Comanches did, and there was some type of misunderstanding. The U.S. thought the Comanches would agree to move to a reservation, but the Comanches thought that they could have the land they were on and continue to hunt bison. And so they would continue to hunt bison, but they would also continue to raid local villages. The U.S. military stepped in and forced the Comanche to a reservation in Oklahoma. It was just some small skirmishes between the U.S. military and the Comanche and some other tribes in the area. But that time, the mo by, uh, by that time, I'm sorry, the most, they were the most powerful Native American tribe. And they were becoming weaker and weaker. And a lot of this had to do with the railroad going through their territory and more and more settlers taking their land. Before this, people were scared, scared of the Comanches. There's too many settlers coming in. And this would really end the, fr the free roaming of Native Americans in the South. The Battle of Little Bighorn. So in 1874, as I mentioned a, a while ago, gold was discovered in the Black Hills of South Dakota. So prospectors swarmed to the Black Hills. But by doing so, they were breaking prior treaties they were illegally going into the Great Sioux Reservations. Government officials urged the Sioux to sign new treaties allowing settlers into the Black Hills area. At the same time, the government was also sending in, the American government was also sending in soldiers to the area. Fighting would ensue. The Sioux leader, Sitting Bull, attracted more Sioux to join the fight. And the Sioux would have some small victories. And this is when Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer was sent in to fight the Sioux, and he would die. Him and his group, his, 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 um, his soldiers, they were outnumbered. Every one of Custer's men died in this battle, uh, and this battle only lasted an hour. It was 268 Americans who died, and this is most famously known as Custer's Last Stand. And news of Custer's defeat spread around the country. The U.S. military was sent in to crush the Sioux resistance, and the Sioux would eventually surrender. Crazy Horse of the Aglala Band fought in the war as well, and he too would surrender. And a few months later, he was killed by an American soldier for resisting imprisonment. And this is Crazy Horse Memorial. In 1948, it was started in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and it's not far from Mount Rushmore. 
uh, is still not finished today. And the memorial was privately funded. The original sculptor refused accepting American government money. Now, there's also something at this time period called the Long Walk of the Navajo. So the United States wanted to remove the Navajo in the Southwest to a reservation. The U.S. wanted them to assimilate to American culture and to stop raiding villages. So in 1863, Colonel Kit Carson escorted the entire Navajo in the Southwest to Bosque Redondo. At Bosque Redondo, they were tried to assimilate and to Christianize Navajo. And there was a series of forced marches, which would be called the Long March of the Navajo. And many people, many natives would die on this march. It was 350 miles. So between 1863 and 1866, Bosque Redondo was in terrible conditions. People would die, were dying from starvation because they couldn't work the land. They couldn't grow crops. In 1868, the now celebrity William Tecumseh Sherman from the Civil War fighting for the Union, he visited Bosque Redondo and he wrote about how terrible the living conditions were. So in 1866, the Treaty of Bosque Redondo was passed. Uh, the Congress agreed to let William Tecumseh Sherman to sign the treaty and the Navajo could go back to their ancestral land on a reservation. It was a success because they could have autonomy on the reservation, but it was a failure because they were still under American rule. Now I want to talk a little bit about Buffalo Soldiers. Now, the Buffalo Soldiers were the first peacetime African-American regiment in the United States. Now, there were African-Americans who fought for the Union Army during the American Civil War, uh, but this was in peacetime. And uh, the, the name Buffalo Soldier actually comes from, from the Native Americans. They called the, the, the African-American soldiers Buffalo Soldiers. The ne next section is about Western economic expansion. So agriculture, the extraction of resources like timber, gold, silver, and other precious metals, ranching, and the railroad was the new economy of the West. Railroads and ranching connected people to each other, displaced the Native American cultures, and created the mythic idea of the Wild West. So the railroads, this is big business in the late 1800s. Private investors' um, money and government subsidies funded these projects. The railroad really transformed the West. In 1862, the Pacific Railroad Act was passed. Bonds were, were created and land grants to railroad companies were given. Between 1850 and 1871, companies received more than 175,000 acres of land, and this is larger than the size of Texas. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed. It linked the East to the West. It was the Central Pacific which built the West, it was the Union Pacific which built the East. Both lines linked in Utah in 1869. So labor on the railroads. So there was a great demand for labor. In 1880, there were 400,000 men working on the railroad. Early 1800s, more of the Irish and the immigrants were laying tracks. In the late 1800s, more of the Chinese immigrants that were laying tracks. The workers were, were first needed to lay track, but then there were workers needed to keep the trains operating. And one of the most dangerous jobs at the time was called the brakeman. He, was, he, was, he, he had to run on top of the train, running car to car manually, turning the brake valve. He also had to attach the, the, the cars, and many brakemen would lose their finger. Here's a picture of, uh, of a brakeman. Uh, so, like I said, it was the most dangerous job. And sometimes they would run on the top, and sometimes they would run between the cars. And um, they had to do it no matter what the weather was like. If the weather was bad, if the weather was good, snowing, they had to get on top. Um, and it was very, very dangerous. Now, with the railroads, is going to become cities, and it's going to become towns and some major hubs which is going to really grow and develop some of the major cities that we see in the United States today. And one of those is Chicago. So the railroad boom. So in 1850, 
there was 9,000 miles of railroads. In 1900, there was 190,000 miles of railroads. With the boom, the hub stations were created, like Chicago. And Chicago became a major hub, and it helped the city grow. And resources from the west and capital from the east made Chicago. So in 1833, there was only 200 people living in Chicago. In 1890, 1 million people lived in Chicago. In 1893, they had the World's Columbian Exposition. It's also known as the World's Fair. It was the 400th anniversary of Columbus, and it wanted to, to display the progress that the United States and the, the Europeans and the New World had made over the 400 years. And people all over the world attended. It was grandiose. They built this great temporary white city. And yeah, so, so this, this, this made Chicago. This brings us to the cattle drive. In the 1860s and the 1870s, there was a fabled cattle drive across the American plains. Railroads built the market for ranching in the West. Now, ranching is breeding cattle, and it would replace the hunting of the bison. Railroads did not originally go through Texas, so cowboys drove cattle up different trails to hubs like the Kansas or Missouri or Nebraska hub, which would go to Chicago. Now, along the way, they had conflicts with local Native American tribes and farmers in Kansas as well, so they would find new trails. In the late 1800s, there were between 12,000 and 40,000 cattle drivers, and about 25% were African American, and a larger percent were Mexicans or Mexican Americans. Words like rodeo, bronco, and lasso, they're all Spanish. It was incredible, incredibly difficult work. Later, images of cowboys and Native Americans spread through vaudeville shows and later in movies. Now, many trees, we're going to the next section here, many trees with the Native Americans in the West, and many of them were broken. Settlers argued Native American tribes had too much land and they were not using it efficiently. Settlers wanted to give some Native American land to farmers. Settlers wanted the Native Americans to adapt American farming ways. Instead of giving land to Native American tribes, they would give Na uh, Native American families land. So this would change the reservation system. The Dawes Act of 1887. It's also known as the General Allotment Act. Each Native American family was allotted 160 acres of land, just like the Homestead Act. Singles received 80 acres, orphan children received 40 acres. Native Americans had four years to choose land. If they didn't choose land, the federal government would choose it for them, and they couldn't sell this land for 20 years. Land that was not chosen became federal land. Now, this changed the Native American perceptions of land, and it forced them to adopt American private property systems. Some Americans thought the method was humane, but it permanently changed the culture of Native Americans and Native Americans lost sovereignty over their land. The Dawes Act ended the reservation system, but in the 1930s, under FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he passed the Indian Reorganization Act, which would end the, uh, the allotment created by the Dawes Act and resurrected the reservation system that you see today. Native Americans often turned to profits during difficult times. In 1889, there was a Native American prophet that said he went to heaven during a solar eclipse. He came back to the, tell the Native Americans to not fight, but to be good. He said they must participate in the ghost dance. He said if they did that, ancestors would rise from the dead, that droughts would end, that American settlers would vanish, and the bison would roam the plains again. The ghost dance spread to many tribes in the West. Some believe it was created in resistance to assimilation created by the Dawes Act. The Lakota Sioux were the most famous for their ghost dances. And this brings us to the Battle of Wounded Knee. So homesteaders kept taking Lakota land in South Dakota. The federal government cut promised food rations. Kicking Bear a Native American named Kicking Bear brought the ghost dance from Nevada to South Dakota. 
Now, the ghost dance frightened a lot of the settlers in South Dakota and other areas. Newspapers sensationalized the ghost dance. In 1890, Sitting Bull instructed, was instructed by the federal government to stop the ghost dance, or the local government. The ghost dances continued, though, and eventually they tried to arrest Sitting Bull, and there would be a botched arrest, and Sitting Bull would, would die. The Lakota fled and met with some different fugitive Lakota tribe members who said that the ghost dance would protect them from bullets. So 350 Lakota were caught and they were escorted to a place called Wounded Knee Creek. While being disarmed, somebody shot a fire and a massacre would ensue. 25, 24 American cavalry would die and between 150 and 300 Lakota died. This is an important point. The Battle of Wounded Knee ended Native American resistance. Now, there's going to be some individual resistance among the Native Americans, but the overall movement of Native Americans resisting uh, federal and United States encroachment would end in Wounded Knee. Novels, vaudeville shows, rodeos, Wild West traveling shows, and later movies create a mythic impression of the American West. Rodeos began as roping and riding contests. And the first rodeo was in 1883. It was in Picos, Texas. And this was a contest between the Hash Knife Rants and the West Rants. Now, many rodeos were planned around national holidays, so it would be a big gathering for the family and the local community. And they actually took place on grassy fields. So it's not like in the arenas that you see today when you think of a rodeo. So traveling Wild West shows would help to create this image of the Wild West. So these shows, they would travel throughout the East. William Frederick Buffalo Bill Cody created what is known as the Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Now, these would be shows, and there would be real cowboys, and there would be real Native Americans that were employed. And they wanted, or Buffalo Bill wanted to depict the real West, but it was actually just entertainment. People in the East and Europe were fascinated about these, about the West in general, and they really enjoyed these shows. Many people in the East living in cities felt they were privileged. They wanted to experience the strenuous life that was like in the West. Now, there's this thesis. When you're looking at the West, there's this, this idea it was called the Frontier Thesis. It was by a guy named Frederick Jackson Turner in 1893. And he argued that the theory of the West was not just encroachment in war. He said it was moving from savagery to civilization. It can be rooted back from when the when English first landed in Virginia and Massachusetts in the early 1600s. Turner felt the pioneers to the West deserved the same amount of praise and study as given to the founding fathers. Now, modern historians find a lot of fault in Turner's thesis, the frontier thesis. Uh, they say it downplays the white chauvinism. It also ignores the impact of technology and government subsidies to help the pioneers move to the West. But nonetheless, Turner's theory, the frontier thesis, became uh, very influential to historians in the 1900s. And it also portrayed this mythic image of the West. All right. Well, thank you for listening. So this is the end of today's presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you could do me a favor, if you could press the, the, the subscribe button and also give me a like. And also, please, most importantly, send this video to your students or to any of your friends that are trying to learn American history. I think that would, that, that's all I'd ask. That would be very helpful, helpful to me. And of course, like I mentioned before, I, I do sell some um, some very useful teaching and learning products. So please visit the Lesson in Humanity store below. See you next time.